I had an employer who was very micromanaging of her workers. This is Sarah Hinya, who joined me in Studio 3 in Philadelphia to share her experience with Tourette's syndrome. And I had a particular tick at the time where I said in a very friendly way, what do you think about cheesecake? What do you think about cheesecake? Very innocent, literally the cake. She decided that that was a euphemism for nude photographs and that it wasn't appropriate for me to be asking those types of questions. She handed me a rubber band, put it around my wrist, and told me to snap it every time I thought about doing the tick, and that she would hate it if I had to lose my job over this. This is not an unusual story for a patient with a chronic tick disorder. Having ticks not only draws such intense, derisive attention to oneself... Yeah, it's awkward to have someone stare at you on a train. It becomes your identity, just like the color of your skin and your sexual orientation. Something others can use to judge you. It was my identifier. To have endured this sort of social stigmatization, that something was inherently wrong with you, or worse, that you were choosing to do something wrong. When I walked down the hallway, people knew me as the girl who was faking Tourette's, that's what they thought. To feel the stress of, quote, social norms being placed on you, only to have that stress trigger more of these uncontrollable motor and vocal behaviors. I didn't want to be disabled. And if only to add insult to injury, the fact that these behaviors emerge at a time in development where children and adolescents already face intense scrutiny by their peers, it's no wonder that many neuropsychiatric comorbidities exist alongside a chronic tic disorder. The toughest part about anyone who has Tourette's is not the physical tics usually, it's the comorbidities that come with it. This week on Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine, and all the fascinating science and history that come with it, we'll begin a two-part series on the neurology patient experience. Two stories about patients with chronic neurologic illnesses, featuring their perspectives and insights while coping with brain disease, and what lessons that they can teach us through their courage and resilience. Lessons we can't learn from the bedside while we ask them about their allergies or test their reflexes. It is not you that is disabled necessarily, it's the world that is disabling. I'm very excited about these next two shows, and if you liked hearing from Tori Robinson in episode 65 talk about her experience dealing with epilepsy and brain surgery, or Pat Green, episode 61, who shared his story about a surprising cancer diagnosis, then I think you're going to enjoy what comes next. Fair warning, in today's program there will be some cursing. I'm going to curse probably, maybe not, maybe I will, that's up to you. So this show may not be suitable for younger audiences. I'm Jim Sigler. Let's get right to it. I came across Sarah Henya's story in a news article that one of our producers, Mike Rubenstein, shared with me. I'm Sarah Henya. I'm currently 25 years old. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'm a primarily a musician, a reader, and I have Tourette's, I guess. For the purposes of this podcast, that's very important, but in my daily life it probably wouldn't come up. I'll start off by saying that Sarah is a very unique individual. My first impression of her was she was a very quiet, unassuming, and collected young woman, five foot nine, brown hair, slender build, and yet she had extensive body art, tattoos strewn across her skin, and a sleeve covering her entire left leg. My entire back is covered also. 10 body piercings. I used to have more. I used to work at a piercing shop. She's got these vibrant high top shoes splashed with color and a personality to match it. I'm just a very, I don't know if this is accurate, but a right brained person, I suppose. I don't know if left and right (laughs) brain is medically accurate, but in the social colloquialism, you know what I'm trying to say. And one of the first things that she said on the mic was a quote from the Greek tragedy Antigone. Antigone, sister of mine blood and heart, seest thou how Zeus would in our lives fulfill the weird of Oedipus, a world of woes? I'm sorry, I'm not cultured. So you have to- <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a weirdo, don't mind me. <laughs> That's okay. And then every once in a while, you'll notice something else about her. Mm-hmm. A brief phonic tick. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it would be more than just a sound, like a throat clearing, mm-hmm. a loud yip kind of noise. Like a Yoshi noise, I guess. Or grunting. <clears throat> Sometimes it's a complex vocal string. Backpack. Which we refer to as echolalia. Or the vocalization could even sound insulting. Leave me the fuck alone. Which we call coprolalia. Unlike a lot of the patients that I encounter in my day-to-day practice, these patients who have a chronic neurologic condition, 
Sarah doesn't let Tourette's control her life. Sure, she volunteers for a variety of Tourette's Syndrome camps, including the Tim Howard Leadership Academy based out of Rutgers, Tim Howard Leadership Academy, which I simply can't say enough great things about. I had the idea for a leadership program for many years. For kids, which is so rewarding. I knew it was something that the Tourette Syndrome community needed. Sarah has spoken about tick disorders on Fox News, and she's a very well-known patient advocate for Tourette's syndrome. But she identifies less with this condition and more with who she is as a person, which I find very admirable. I rebelled against being a person with Tourette's and instead becoming just a person. You see, Sarah Hinya is probably first and foremost a musician, a harpist and a singer-songwriter. And that talent has been more of a determinant of her life and career goals. I was just good at music. Run, run to me. I've always had a propensity for it. It's been the only thing I've ever wanted to do. So that's what I did. And playing on stage in a crowd of people, you'd think it might cause her stress. But in fact, it relieves her of her tics. When you're on stage, you're supposed to be there. You have a, a start time and an end time. Everyone's supposed to pay attention to you, and you have lots of room to do whatever you need to do. When you're standing in a crowd, I feel like I'm in everyone's way. I don't know if I'm supposed to be there. When am I leaving? Am I with a group of people? It's just like a crowd of fears that start overhanging you. But in a formal setting where I'm the person playing, one, I'm distracted because I'm playing, and I don't tick while I play. But then also, I'm supposed to be there, so I feel very confident about performing. As a kid, Sarah grew up playing the piano, and later the guitar and the trombone, and then she was also a classical singer from an early age. But Sarah never felt an ownership of any of these instruments, until she was introduced to the harp by a friend's mother. I was 16 at the time. And while she was a little late for picking up a new instrument that would later define her career, you know, Chopin was six years old when he began composing songs on the piano, Sarah quickly mastered the harp, and so it was that her musical career really took off. Writer, and now you've got a new album that's coming out. Uh, it doesn't have a name yet. We're currently in the recording process. Uh, we're about eight songs in out of ten or eleven. Um, it's really exciting. I would say in the normal and her ticks while they're there, they're not a major part of who she is. I would say from a day-to-day -day perspective, it doesn't really affect me that much. I have created a world in which it is not a problem. But I would say most people don't have the ability to do that. And that's where it becomes a problem. But it wasn't always this easy. For years, Sarah had to deal with her tics. At first, they were just sounds and movements. Then later came more complex phonic tics. I remember at 16, I got my first word, which was backpack. And later, she developed more complicated vocal tics. What do you think about cheesecake? And some tics were more complicated motor functions. I was very violent against myself when I was a teenager. I had a lot of punching and hitting tics where I would hitting myself a lot and walls and objects. But for most tics that Sarah experienced, and for most tics that are experienced by patients with TS, they aren't as physically injurious as they are psychosocially painful. Here's Sarah again. People staring at you is not really that big of a deal. It's not being able to function mentally because of something underlying and then it becomes worse because you physically then aren't able to control yourself. Eventually, Sarah sought medical attention for her condition, these physical and vocal tics. Yeah, so I have sort of an interesting family history. My father has some sort of tics, definitely undiagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder. And then my brother uh, was the one who was first formally diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome when he was much younger than me, by Dr. Rubenstein, actually. Dr. Rubenstein, as in Dr. Mike Rubenstein, one of the producers of our show. And I am a general neurologist uh, in the Philadelphia area working at the University of Pennsylvania currently. And early on in my practice, I began to see Tourette's patients, partially because I was diagnosed with Tourette's. More on that later. I take care of a lot of kids with Tourette's, such as Sarah and her brother. For me, my parents decided after seeing my brother go through cognitive behavioral therapy and medications that he did not do that well on, they decided to let me live a normal, quote unquote, childhood. Normal meaning unmedicated. And that if I really wanted a diagnosis, I could do that later in life. In talking with Sarah, I got the sense that 
Although both of her parents were scientifically oriented, father was a computer engineer, mother a biologist, I got the sense that Sarah's parents tried to shield her from her condition. There being no cure for Tourette's, and having only seen the consequences of attempted treatment of Sarah's brother, what was the point of putting Sarah through the grief of knowing, hey, you have a problem? It was abnormal in a sense that they didn't tell me that Tourette's existed, so my brother wasn't allowed to tell me about it. And it became very clear very quickly that I also had this, but I didn't register for me that that was going on. So I would receive comments from my parents like, what are you doing? Stop doing that. For a long time, it was felt to be a psychiatric disorder and not a medical disorder. And it was, uh, it was actually when I first started practicing, it was still considered a psychiatric diagnosis. They knew what it was, but I didn't know. So I was like, <clears throat> I can't stop. Backpack. I don't know why you're angry. But it's not a primarily psychiatric disease. Ticks are not 100% under a person's control. Dr. Rubenstein had a really great explanation for how we think that TS works on the neuroanatomic level. We know that the basic problem is in the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia serves as a, as a, you know, as a relay center for a lot of sensory input that comes in from the body. And if we think about it, you know, here we are sitting there with like, you know, millions and millions of, of sensory receptors throughout our body. And all of these receptors are sending information to your brain at any one time. You know, it's like mind boggling, you know, from a standpoint of the processing that the brain has to do for that. So it, it stands the reason that the brain would filter most of this stuff out if it's not necessary for it to reach the level of consciousness. So we're sitting here and, you know, you've got these hairs on your leg. And, and so you would imagine that these things are kind of sending these, this input to your brain and your brain is saying, it doesn't matter. It's not important. It's not something that I need to worry about. And what happens in patients with Tourette syndrome is that we don't filter that information out. So, now 14 years old, after having a few years of symptoms, Sarah finally asked her parents to take her to see a doctor about everything. I would say I was a really angsty teenager. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to me, it was, I really need to be here and I want to be in control of my own medical interventions. And this doctor is trying to tell me, you, okay, well, here's the normal. First, you're going to go on this medication and then we'll try this one. And that's the normal way we go about it. And I was like, well, me, I don't want to do the normal thing. Um, Typical teenage response. Yeah, I think I definitely respected him as a neurologist. He was my brother's neurologist. Also, I didn't have any problems with him or what he was saying. I recently went back and did read the medical history, the entire thing. And he is very professional, very knowledgeable, looked at me and knew exactly what was happening and went, here's what we're going to try. This is going to work for her. And some of the things really did. I definitely trusted him enough to go back and seek anti-anxiety help. I went back to him at age 18 or 19, and he was extremely helpful, extremely available to me. And I am so thankful that I have somebody so close to me who is easy for me to reach out to. In speaking with Dr. Rubenstein, Sarah's case was pretty classic for TS. But having tics is not enough. To make the diagnosis of Tourette's, it's more than just tics. So tics are very common. Lots of people have tics. As many as 1-5% to of children have some sort of tic. But the cause of those tics doesn't have to be Tourette syndrome. Tourette syndrome is a probably also a collection of very specific things. And according to the DSM-5, these criteria have changed a bit from the prior version. You have to have two or more motor tics, one or more vocal tics. It has to present before the age of 18, and it has to persist for at least a year. But one of the things that is probably the, the most helpful in making a diagnosis in Tourette's is that probably about 80% of Tourette's patients have some comorbid um, psychological manifestation. This is not a requirement, but it's definitely helpful when the formal diagnostic criteria are not met. Like when you have a 14-year-old who has vocal and motor tics that haven't persisted for that full year. Say they've had this these tics for six months. But the patient also has difficulty with attention in the classroom either obsessive compulsive behavior slash anxiety or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or both. So like I said earlier, and just as Dr. Rubenstein had picked up pretty quickly, Sarah had classic TS, typical age of onset and childhood, progression of symptoms through the teenage years, 
having several years of symptoms of unremitting motor and phonic tics, several family members affected, and no obvious antecedent trigger. Lots of people can have tics, but not all of those people are Tourette syndrome diagnosis. In the clinic, you've got to consider the possibility that your patient doesn't have TS. Maybe it's something else, a condition like Wilson's disease, which is a common kind of neuropsychiatric disorder that also causes abnormal movements. Or sometimes there's an infectious trigger, like group A streptococcus, which can cause a rare condition called pandas that we're not even going to get into this week. Or Sydenham's chorea, which doesn't really look like ticks at all. You know, we're dealing typically with the younger population, so we're really not worrying about, you know, people having like uh, Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease. <laughs> so we're not, we're not dealing with You might find that there was an environmental or a pharmacologic trigger, like a neurostimulant. Or maybe there's eye blinks or blepharospasm, or it's a paroxysmal dyskinesia. Or if you're really at a loss and the story doesn't add up, could the patient be seizing? Or could it even be a functional disorder? So there's very few things. I mean, when, it, when somebody walks in and they give a great description of Tourette's, I don't do any other testing to rule anything out. Now, I want to backtrack here for a quick tangent. I'll say that Mike wasn't always the renowned Tourette's specialist that we know him today. Long before his 30-plus years treating patients and families like Sarah's, long before he served on the Tourette's Syndrome Association Board of Directors, Mike was a medical student just like you or me. I was always just a fidgety kid, but I had all these other kind of problems with focus and attention and obsessive compulsive and anxiety. But back then, you know, the Tourette's world hadn't really described those things, and they also hadn't described the premonitory sensations. Sensations like the strange prickly feeling that you get that drives you to shrug your shoulder or clear your throat. <clears throat> Backpack. Or twist your neck. Which I was experiencing, but I didn't know what they were because nobody really had written about them or described them. So when I was in medical school, I was working with a pediatric neurologist by the name of Douglas Dove, who basically, after working with him for a couple of weeks, he kind of came up to me and said, uh, so how long have you had Tourette syndrome? And I said, what are you talking about? I don't have Tourette syndrome. I have a cousin with Tourette syndrome. I know what Tourette syndrome looks like. And then all of a sudden, like, dawned on me. It's like, wait a minute, I have a cousin with Tourette syndrome. It all started to click for Mike. I couldn't sit there still. He knew TS was hereditary, with some models suggesting an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance with various genetic associations. As a student, Dr. Rubenstein knew it manifested in adolescence. But if you look back at the historic data, like Dr. Rubenstein said, TS was not that well characterized. In 1984, TS was thought to affect 5 out of every 10,000 people, a prevalence estimate much lower than the 1 in 100 that we now recognize. And still, Mike's symptoms were classic for the condition, and his mentor picked it up. No, I've been watching you for two weeks. There's absolutely no question in my mind. He was a pediatric neurologist. He said, absolutely no question in my mind that you have Tourette syndrome. So, I mean, what happens? Um, so most of my tics are body adjustment tics, throat clearing, <clears throat> coughing, sniffling, <clears throat> snorting kind of things. <clears throat> I don't really say any words. And so my tics are... Every I'm once in a while subtle, with yeah. Mike, you might catch him trying to tip his head to the side yeah. as if he's adjusting his um, coat. Very subtle, wanna, not injurious, patient, not embarrassing. You know, just a, patient, a tick. <clears throat> the, the, the part of the Tourette's that has been the kind of defining factor for me really has been more of the the sensory urges and premonitory sensations that I have. You know, the way to describe it is feeling like um, there's this sense or urge that something is not correct. It feels like you are lying in bed and you haven't turned over in 30 minutes and you're really physically uncomfortable and your body is saying, turn over right now, but you kind of can't. Something is not like comfortable or in place, and then you have to move or do something or clear your throat mm -hmm. to make that go away. What do you think about cheesecake, backpack? And then it goes away for maybe 10 seconds, and then it comes back again. <clears throat> and for the most part, unlike other movement disorders, the movement disturbances of a patient with tics is semi-voluntary. There is some degree of control that the patient has over these symptoms, some degree of suppressibility but there's only so much of that sensory discomfort that one can take before you just have to do it. For Dr. Rubenstein, like probably the majority of patients with TS, 
His personal struggle had little to do with the tics themselves. It was the comorbid psychiatric manifestations. So the place that it's most apparent is probably in the amount of obsessive compulsive behavior and anxiety that I've had over the years. As many as 50% of patients with TS are formally diagnosed with OCD, and ADHD, another 30 to 50%. Where people are aware of that, you know, I, like I've always said that I'm probably like really difficult to work with. It's been more noticeable from that standpoint, and that's kind of the whole aspect of Tourette's as far as the kind of comorbid behavioral uh, manifestations of obsessive compulsive behavior and anxiety and ADHD that are associated with it. And when Dr. Rubenstein is in the clinic and he's counseling families and patients about these comorbid manifestations, these symptoms are a major concern when it comes to the treatment because these tend to be the most disabling. Yes, tics can lead to self-injurious behavior, like Sarah had mentioned earlier, but by and large, tics are typically not physically harmful, whereas the neuropsychiatric disease more often can be. But let's say that the patient well, I mean, wanted treatment for the tick aspect. Said, what then? It's, it's really, we're treating symptoms. So The goal of treatment in TS is to manage symptoms, not to cure the disease. We have no disease-modifying therapy for TS. So the patient has to feel that those symptoms are bothersome or disabling. And it, it can be that the, the symptoms like ticks can be physically uncomfortable. They can also be socially uncomfortable. So if a, if a kid's in middle school and doesn't like, you know, their ticks make them very self-conscious, then that's not a reason not to treat, but the patient has to be the one to sign up for that aspect of it. And so, and with any treatment, especially when you're treating symptoms that are almost never life-threatening or seriously disabling, and I'm not trying to downplay how serious ticks can be, you have to think, is the benefit worth the risk? Then you talk about all the different types of therapies that are available, and one of the things... In considering the therapies for TS, imagine a kind of a three-way Venn diagram. In one bubble, we have behavioral therapies. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT. Comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics. Or CBIT habit reversal, relaxation therapies, and so forth. All the different things that we do. In the second bubble of the Venn diagram, we have the pharmacologic treatments. Typically the alpha agonists. Drugs like clonidine and guanfacine, which are some of the best tolerated, but they can lower your blood pressure. Topiramate. The pleiotropic anticonvulsant, which has been shown to reduce tick burden in at least one small randomized trial of 29 patients. Then we have antipsychotics. Atypical neuroleptic medications. Which are preferred over the typical neuroleptics like haloperidol due to their relatively more favorable side effect profile. But haloperidol is a tried and true drug for the treatment of ticks. Which for years was the gold standard for treating this. Then why wouldn't anybody be surprised here? On Thursday, Pennsylvania Health Secretary Dr. Rachel Levine announced anxiety disorders and Tourette syndrome are being approved in the state's medical marijuana program. The AAN treatment guidelines make mention of cannabis. She says medical marijuana should not be first-line treatment for anxiety disorders and should be used alongside counseling and therapy. Patients with now, they do acknowledge that there's currently no evidence supporting efficacy of marijuana or any of its derivatives for TS. Despite the growing interest in medical use of cannabis, data with strong clinical evidence remain limited. Moving and I will say that in the disclosures, one of the guideline authors appears to have received considerable financial support from companies that sell marijuana derivatives. But in choosing those medicines, you choose medicines based on comorbid features that the patient has. So if the patient has ADHD, the medicine that's the most effective are stimulants, but in about 50% of patients with ticks, they're going to tick more on a stimulant. Returning to our three-way Venn diagram, in the third bubble, we have surgical approaches, which would include things like deep brain stimulation. Now each of these domains of treatment, each of these bubbles, they're all overlapping, and experts don't recommend using only one approach. You shouldn't just start a patient on guanfacine and deny them the opportunity for CBIT or other non-pharmacologic interventions. You shouldn't jump straight into deep brain stimulation or recommend the exclusive use of meditation to manage tick symptoms. It's best to consider them in combination, especially the interventions with the lowest risk, like CBT or CBIT, in conjunction with any potential pharmacologic strategies. You have to kind of use all of those things together. And counseling is beneficial. The recent 2019 AAM practice guidelines on the treatment of TS, to which Dr. Rubenstein and I are referencing, 
The very first recommendation, Recommendation 1A, states that clinicians must inform patients and their caregivers about the natural history of tick disorders. So the natural history of ticks are that ticks typically get better uh, in the late teens and early 20s, not always. Uh, I have many adult patients who have very severe ticks. It's rare that adult ticks are worse than their childhood ticks. Because of that, patients should know that they may not necessarily need treatment. If they are treated, then treatment's often not lifelong. And then, because treatment is not lifelong, it is the responsibility of the physician to reevaluate whether and when to discontinue a treatment. But unlike the ticks, those other neuropsychiatric comorbidities, they tend to stick around. The personality traits like OCD, anxiety, and ADHD, those don't change during your lifetime. Those are kind of embedded, hardwired uh, personality traits that remain for your entire life. So in a patient with comorbid anxiety or depression, you might consider an SSRI or SNRI in your patient who also has TS. Probably won't affect the ticks much. But if anxiety is a major factor triggering the tics, and it's disabling to the patient, the patient may get some relief if those symptoms are treated. But remember, these are all symptomatic approaches. We have no disease-modifying therapies, no cure for TS. It doesn't have to be treated unless you want it to be. If the symptoms are bothersome, if the symptoms disturb your quality of life, then there are great strategies which can help you. It is up to you whether or not you want to be diagnosed you want to have some sort of medication, you want to go into therapy, it's all up to you. If you're able to live with them and it's just the social stigma, who cares? Like, yeah, it's awkward to have someone stare at you on a train. That's totally fine and you don't have to worry about it. It's gonna be okay. And for the parents in the audience, while it's really not the objective of brainwaves to provide any sort of medical advice or to prognosticate, Sarah wanted to end on a positive note. It's gonna get better. Your child will understand later and be able to tell you verbally what's going on with them. I know it's hard to understand now. Rarely does TS ever get worse. For the most part, patients with TS grow up to live full and productive lives. Your child is going to be fine. Sarah Henya and Mike Rubenstein, everybody. You can find more about Sarah and her original music on her personal website, sarahenya.com. That's S-A-R-A-H-E-N-Y-A.com. For patients out there, we briefly mentioned some of the available resources specifically on Tourette's, including the Tim Howard Leadership Academy. They're really an amazing organization that works with uh, Tourette's patients, as is the uh, Pennsylvania Tourette Syndrome Alliance. You can get more information about the Tim Howard Leadership Academy at njcts.org slash academy. And to learn more about the Tourette's Association of America, the TAA, go to tourette.org and click the Get Involved banner. So there's lots of resources for patients. This episode of the Brainwaves Podcast was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, with the help of Mike Rubenstein and Sarah Hinya, with original music and vocals by Sarah as well, in addition to Lee Rosevear, Loyalty Freak Music, Marco Trovatello, and Steve Coombs. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeone. Coming up next, we'll continue our patient narrative with the case of a neurology resident whose rare condition has only become treatable in his lifetime. Until then, I'm Jim Suka for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening. If you want to Um, what do you foresee as your future? Like, what's gonna, what's next? I'm shooting for the moon here. I want to put out music that a lot of people are gonna listen to. I want to be on a late night television show playing my new song on a new album. I want to be nominated for some music award. Maybe I'll never get there, but if I don't put it out into the universe that that's what I want, it'll never happen. <laughs>